We are spending some time this month focusing on getting to know the Holy Spirit. If you are new to church and new to Christianity, um, the uh, Christian, Christians believe that God is more than one person. He's God, God himself is three persons, that God himself is one God but a family, a family of three. Um, so close, though, is this family of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that they're one being. And so the Holy Spirit is the third person of this family, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's who we're talking about and wanting to get to know a little deeper this month. The month of February is, um, is, is a good time to, to dream for the year ahead. Um, and today in particular, being AGM Day, it's a celebration of what's gone, what's coming. Um, and I believe that what's ahead for us this year is a deeper dependence on and obedience to the Holy Spirit. I'll just have this down a bit, Clayton. You've heard us um, say now that, that some 2017 priorities that the leadership team wish to encourage us all to get behind is going deeper in prayer, doing life together in different ways and spaces and places, and sharing our faith. Prayer lifted, life together, faith shared. And um, that's faith shared with those who don't know Jesus. Each of these priorities are possible only as the Spirit enables us as the Spirit helps us, as the Holy Spirit gets, comes alongside us and leads us. Um, and there's two popular, if you like, concepts in the Scriptures which relate to the Holy Spirit's role in our life of faith. One, you probably would have heard if you've been around church, is the gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to talk a bit about that next week. The other is the fruit of the Spirit. And on this day, as we look to the year ahead, I can't think of a better topic to, to help us get our perspective right, uh, to encourage us how the Spirit works in our lives and what it looks like then, the fruit of the Spirit. So I'm going to pray and, uh, and we'll get into that. Father, we thank you this morning for your great love for us. We thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice for us and we thank you for the Holy Spirit sent to us to be the invisible God in this world and in our lives. Holy Spirit, we ask that as we open the scriptures this morning, you would help us to become to, to learn something more of you, to get to know you just a little bit better, and that you would speak to us. Spirit of God, open our hearts, open our ears this morning to receive from you. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, our Lord, our God, and our Saviour. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. The, um, the concept of the fruit of the Spirit comes from um, Galatians. This is one of the earliest uh, letters in the New Testament written by a guy named Paul. And um, if you look at some of the letters that Paul wrote a little bit later um, in, his, in his ministry, they were much more encouraging and pastoral and positive because he was softening a little bit. In Galatians, on the other hand, he writes things like, I wish those who were false teachers going on about circumcision would just go the whole way and castrate themselves. <laughs> a little bit blunt he was back then, or sharp, depending on how you look at it. And it's because he's angry with something that's happening. He, he's, he's angry, essentially, with that some are teaching, um, and there are, there, there are people who are teaching that to have a relationship with God, you need to trust in Jesus and do these certain things. Now, sure, you can't call yourself a Christian and go around doing bad stuff. But for Paul, this whole thing is really important. He says, if you're going to require anything else in God's laws, you have to require that a person obey all the laws. It's, it's either everything or nothing. In fact, only perfection, only complete obedience to everything in the, in the law of God, is enough to come to the Father. So you either must be completely without fault or you must come through Jesus, who was without fault. Now, don't good people go to heaven, you might say? Well, yes, absolutely. All completely good people have a place in the new heaven and earth that God will establish, every single one of them, which is no one, unless... It's those who come in the name of Jesus because those people have the righteousness of Christ given to them. And what a gift that is. 
Paul, um, he talks about two concepts here, as he says, a background before we get into Galatians 5. One of them is the law of Moses. Now, um, the Old Testament, it contains lots of guiding laws and, and rules for God's people, what to do, what not to do, how to live. Some of it's more of an instruction than a law even, but it's called sometimes the law of Moses. And um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with laws. But consider this. Can a law that says you're not allowed to kill someone stop murder from happening? Well, it can discourage it because there's an there's a implication, but it can't stop it from happening. It can only, the law can only highlight what wrong has been done when it's done. Can a rule, if we had a rule posted up on the back of the, the building there saying, don't bring sand from the sand pit into the building, do you think it would stop the kids from bringing sand in? Just have a look at the back right now. Not even close. Law just points out what's been done against it. So Paul goes so far as to say that if the law becomes a requirement for relationship, you're in slavery because it, it constantly just, it just highlights your faults. That's all it does. You can never quite match up. And it's really strong language, slavery to the law. The second concept he talks about is um, sometimes called sinful nature. It is in the version we'll read. And um, it's related quite closely to slavery to the law. You and I have the capacity for great good within us. We're created in the image of God. We can create beautiful, wonderful things in this life. We can love. We can be somewhat like God. We also have the capacity to do wrong. We also have the capacity to, to be selfish. In fact, give us long enough and we'll always do something selfish. That's the, that's the sinful nature. That other translations call it the flesh our own sin and selfishness are like two sides of the same coin. And so if we're trying to match up to Jesus' standard as a way to please God, then that's slavery because it's a, it's a lost cause. We'll only ever not quite get there. We're bound by it. And so the law only points out failure. We have a sinful nature and so we're, we're slaves. But Paul says this, Christ has truly set us free. How has Christ done that? Let's read Galatians 5. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive faith. By, sorry, to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. For when we placed our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit of being circumcised or being uncircumcised. That was part of the law. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. Faith itself, the scriptures teach, um, is something that the Holy Spirit gives us in the first place. If, if you don't know, don't know what to pray or how to pray or where to start in this whole walk with Jesus, that's the thing to pray for. Pray that God will give you faith because that's a gift from the Holy Spirit in the first place. And the rest will follow from there. A bit further on in the chapter, he says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, opposite of slavery. My uh, not just condemned and, and chained down by the law, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So faith expressing itself in love. If you tear down others, rather than love, then there's still like a slavery to sin there. We all know, though, that it's not automatic. Put up your hand if the moment you became a Christian, you never struggled doing the wrong thing ever again. None of us, right? You may even feel that you've struggled more with sin or selfishness since, since coming to faith, since coming to Jesus, because there's more of an awareness. So how do we move from slavery to freedom? Paul says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. And listen carefully to this, this little passage. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. 
and the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting with each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation of the law of Moses, i.e. you're not a slave to the law and trying to to fulfill it completely. So there's a couple of things here just to highlight, that the Spirit guide your lives, let the Spirit guide your lives, the sinful nature is opposite of what the Spirit wants, and the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the flesh or the sinful nature wants. Here's the best way that I can think to illustrate this. I'm going to need a couple of volunteers, and I'm just going to pick Evie and Martha, if that's okay. I'm going to get you guys in a tug of war. So, uh, Evie, if you can stand this side. Martha, this side. Now, um, this is not in any way a a reflection on either of you, but just for the sake of the illustration, don't take this badly, Martha's going to be sinful nature, okay? You're going to be the flesh. Um, just move this over a bit so I don't hit the thing. And Evie's going to be the, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit's drive in, in, in our lives and Martha, the, the fleshly sort of desire in our lives. Okay, this is kind of the mind. This is my will. Um, this is our, our, our life, if you like, which is being pulled by these two forces. So on three, uh, this is the line here, on three, You're going to pull as hard as you possibly can. Okay, ready? One, two, get some tension first. Okay, yeah. One, two, three. Okay, we just, oh, no, 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 the spirit is winning, winning. I think it's, I think it's just the shoes actually. Okay, cool. That, that time the, um, the spirit won out. Next time, I'm sure Martha would oh, you know, get, get some, some grunt going and, and would win. And this is like the you know, tension. Sometimes we give up to, to temptation. Sometimes we don't, whatever. The thing is, I don't think that this, what we just saw, is an accurate representation of, of this battle. Evie, if you can sit down, and if I can have my other volunteer come up. All right. Okay. Maybe we'll go just just to make it fair. We'll just shoes off. We want some grip on the grip on the ground. Okay. Ready? One on three. One, two, three. All righty. Now one one more thing. One more thing. Just stay there. This, this is the reality, just let, just let go of the rep check, this is the reality, is that it's not an equal battle. This is, this is more the reality than when it was Evie versus Martha. It's not an equal, uh, an equal battle between the two. But what happens is this. Now, whatever happens, this is the last one, whatever happens, no, no, you're going to, you're going to pull on the rope that I give you as hard as you possibly can, okay? I'm going to give it to you on two. And then on three, on three, you're going to pull. No, hands down, hands down. One, two, three. Thanks, guys. You can sit down. This is the way it really is sometimes. We tend to go, here, have the rope. We gave the Spirit the rope. There's no, there's no, there's no struggle. This is let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. If we handed Him the rope, He would throw our sinful nature through the wall. I remember I was at a Christian youth conference um, when I was a teenager, just become a Christian, and myself and a, and a close friend from school, we we encountered God in a in a powerful way. It was and it was an amazing experience. God just came. In. He filled us with his presence, spoke to us. And, and my friend was, was sharing with the, the crew back at the accommodation that night. And one of the youth leaders said, ah, oh, that's the big HG. I said, what, what do you mean? Well, Holy Spirit is sometimes referred to as the Holy Ghost, the, the invisible God in, in this world. The big HG, the big Holy Ghost. He is not weak. 
He's not in a tug of war with our selfish nature, going, oh, I just can't handle this. He's saying, hand me the rope and I will throw your flesh to the ground. Hand me your life daily, weekly, together, individually, when stuff crops up, when you fail, when you forget. Hand me the rope and I will swing it around. I will, I will, I will win. <laughs> Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. How? Well, neither anyone, neither myself nor anyone can, can tell you or, or me that in, in a sermon. Pray, absorb the scriptures, meet with other believers, be teachable, share your faith so you'll have to trust God. All of the stuff that you're probably sick of hearing me say over and over, over again and I'll continue to say all through this year. But only you... With, with many of those tips and, 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 and things that we, we learn as Christians, sure, but only you can learn to give the Spirit control. What the Scriptures can do and what I can show you this morning is what it looks like. Paul says that here's what, looks, here's what your life looks like when you give control to the sinful nature, to the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarrelling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties and other things like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's this funny little line then. There is no law against these things. Neither are they laws that condemn you if you don't match up to them. But hand the rope, hand your life, your will, your mind to the Holy Spirit. And you will see this fruit in your life, in our lives. If we, see, if, if we as a church hand over the reins to the Holy Spirit, this is what we will see. And until that's all we see, we've still got some handing over to do. Until this fruit is all that we see in our life as a church, we've still got to hand him the rope, keep handing him the rope. I believe Paul's trying to get something across here, that it's not a passive thing, this let the Holy Spirit guide our lives. Uh, we don't say, thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice and your love for us, and then just watch idly by as the Spirit gets to work. It says, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. This takes two things in, together with each other, listening and obeying, the essence of what it means to follow Jesus. I don't know a single Christian who doesn't struggle with how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit is an important topic for that reason, which we'll come to next week. It's about the Spirit speaking. But it's very clear how God speaks. He speaks through his word, both when we read it and when we kind of internalize it and familiarize ourselves with it so it shapes our thinking. The word of God, the written word being made alive to us through the Holy Spirit. But I can listen to someone and even respond to them, and it does nothing. My wife knows this best of all. Darling, can you please hang out the washing when it's done? Yes, no worries, Karen. An hour later, darling, did you hang out the washing? Sorry, I was watching TV. Just responding, even listening and responding, it, it doesn't actually do anything. Giving the Holy Spirit control is an action. It's obedience, and I think we actually sense the Spirit's voice and leading more than we think. But obedience is another story. And here's where Paul finishes this chapter. What does giving control to the Holy Spirit look like? What does it look like, really, when we listen and when we obey? It's on the screen. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature 
to his cross and crucified them there. We nail our sins to the cross. Sin is a funny word, maybe outdated, but it just means missing the mark. It's actually an archery term. Confession of sin before God and before one another brings healing. Jesus' brother James wrote, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Sounds a bit like freedom, right? There's a strategy for breaking the power of sin that says deal with the the thing that you can have control over, that you can be released of, and it will help you to start to get the strength to overcome the bigger sinful desires in your life. Handing the, the rope to the Holy Spirit means taking the rope out of your own hands, out of the hands of your flesh, giving up your failings, bring them to Jesus and let him nail them to the cross. And this morning, your third sticky note is provided for you to do that if you wish. To go, God, I'm, I need to give this to you and let you nail it to the cross. Paul finishes This chapter saying, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. We can pray this year, Holy Spirit, come in power. Do a mighty work in our nation, in our church, in this community. Move in us, grow us deeper with you. Build, you know, move Holy Spirit. But only if we're willing to answer when he says, listen to each other. Respect those older than yourself. Be generous. And Paul finishes the body of his letter with some really challenging words for a church like ours. And I just want to read them through to finish. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by by some sin, You who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. You don't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature, but those who live to please the Spirit will have everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. I want to see the Holy Spirit move in power in this church in 2017. I'll get at least one amen for that. (laughs) But I was challenged when I read this and realized I've first got to give him the rope. I've first got to ask God to help me love and serve my brothers and sisters in Christ, to not tire of doing good, to admit I'm not that important and I'm not that good. He is good. The fruit of the Spirit, church, is exactly that. It's the fruit of obedience to the Holy Spirit. And if that's the only fruit we want to see in our church and not any of the other stuff, we've got to take the other stuff and the desires that we have in our own selfishness and nail them to the cross of Christ. That's what this sticky note is for. You don't have to come and leave it on the cross if you don't want to. But I encourage you to write on it that thing that you need to just confess and give over to Jesus. Maybe it's a personal struggle or maybe it's a thing that you want to look different when it comes to your being part of the body of Christ this year. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the 
the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Music team, can you come up and play for us and we'll pray. Father, I thank you that you are here this morning, that your Holy Spirit is working in this church and that last year we have seen people come to faith. We have seen you grow us more to become more like Christ, that we've gotten to know you a little deeper. But even if we don't feel like it, Lord, you have not condemned us. You don't seek to punish us. You seek to only bring us back into your loving arms and to encourage us for the year ahead. And Father, we want to see your Holy Spirit move in this church in 2017. I pray you would first do it in our hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would first change us from the inside out, that sanctification, becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ, would happen as a first step to communal revival in this place. Change us, challenge us, move in us, speak to us and help us to be obedient. Lord, we are sorry for what we've done and we leave our sins and our failings and our selfish desires at the cross of Christ this morning because we know that is what is required in order for us to take the rope out of our own hands and give control to you.